Greetings, reggae fans. This is M. Peggy Quattro, and today I'm backstage with Jamaica songbird Twiggy. From backup vocalist to solo artist throughout the late 80s and 90s, Twiggy blazed a musical trail throughout Kingston Studios. Go with the flow is Twiggy's motto. Here's some history, and here's her story. Twiggy, my dear, welcome to Let's Meet Backstage. It's so nice to have you here. It's so nice to be here. And I love how you say, my dear. (laughs) Well, you are a dear, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Firstly, I have to start off by apologizing to you. And why is that? Well, as many fans and listeners know, I wrote an ebook a little while ago, and it's called Reggae Trilogy, 200 plus 80s and 90s artist headshots. And chapter 13 is called Where Are They Now? And Twiggy is on page one of Where Are They Now? Oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) And I only asked this question of you then with your long braids. I think it was a penthouse shot, right? From Penthouse Records. I only asked this because I was really totally unaware of the amazing work that you have done since the 80s and 90s and your persistence in moving forward in the reggae business, which I respect, until we met on social media. And then it was like, oh, no, I have to speak with this girl. And boom, here we are. Here we are. Here we are. And we're going to talk about the 80s and 90s. And later, you can fill us in on what Twiggy uh, is doing now and what Twiggy has been doing since those pioneering days. So we're cool now, right? Oh, we're definitely cool. All right. Cool, cool. So let's start with some background. I understand you were born in Kingston. Can you tell us a little bit where and did you grow up there? I was born in uh, downtown Kingston at the Jubilee Hospital, but I grew up in uh, an area called Richmond Park, which is like close to like half a tree. And then I'm curious as well as I'm sure fans are, how did you acquire the name Twiggy? Okay, so... I'm always hanging with the boys, even since I've been very young. So uh, a group of boys, uh, KC boys to be exact. I think that's the school that Donovan and Jeremy went to. And uh, they called me Tweety because they said I sang like a bird. So uh, usually the boys, when they see me, they shout the name out and it just sounds like Twiggy. So I told them, let's change it to Twiggy because it rolls off the tongue better. And that's how the name came right. I love that. I love that. At what age did you know that you wanted to be a singer? I never wanted to be a singer, <laughs> especially in, in my household. My parents weren't having it. So I used to just um, love to sing in the mirror, do my Michael Jackson's impersonation, uh, Whitney Houston, uh, Mary Carey, Aretha, all of that. But I was drawn into the music by Tinger Stewart. My sister introduced me to Tinger Stewart, you know, and he told me, OK, I'm going to audition her. And we went to Pentos to be exact. That's my first time in the studios. The first time at Pentos and the first time doing anything professionally in music. And that's how it happened. And tell me, what was the best piece of advice you ever got from the time you were young and were entering into the music business? I never really got any advice per se, but musically, I was around um, people like Boris Gardner and stuff. And they used to teach me how to approach the notes and stuff because he's very meticulous. So, you know, he would make sure pronunciation, uh, diction, you know, make sure that you're, you're, you you know, he taught me how to detect if I'm sharp or if I'm flat or whatever. But other than that, you know, I was told by my parents not to take drugs. My mission is to share pre-internet reggae history. That's what I want to do. I want to talk about the roots of the music and the pioneers and the innovators. So we must talk about 80s and 90s reggae and dance hall. Don't you agree? Oh, sure. I agree. 
I like to call those decades the global era because it was a super revved up time when artists were out touring all around the world and getting signed by labels. Remember when American labels were falling over themselves to sign up artists? You had Atlantic and Sony and Columbia and CBS. It was a very exciting time and it was exciting to witness. You had mentioned that you started your career basically with Tinga. Right? That yes. was like 1989, right? Around Yes, there. it was. And I just want to tell you that Tinga was our very first Reggae Report cover. Yeah. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, he, yes. was a, he was, yeah, he was, he was a real brethren. You know, I still love to see him today every time I get, get the chance. Now, you also sang backup for Tinga. Right. And then he um, not necessarily just in the studio, in the studio. Mm-hmm. So you recorded backup with Tinga. Yes. OK, very good. And then he introduced you to Boris Gardner and Ruddy Thomas. And that got yes. you going. Now, you also collaborated with a lot of uh, 90s singers. Tell me about that experience. Oh, the 90s singers uh, doing like collaborations or background vocals in studio. Uh, um, well, you did both, but you started out as background, right? And then yeah. that led you to collaborating. Right. So that I, experience for you? Um, and what did you learn? I, I think it just flowed uh, easily because... Um, I didn't go into the music with any expectations, really, because, as I said before, I didn't plan for the music. So I was just going with the flow. Here's a clip from Twiggy's 2020 single, Don't Give Up, produced and released by Earth Strong Productions. Because for me, it, it was something that I loved doing as a child, not knowing that I would end up doing it professionally. So for me, it was like pretty cool. And, you know, when I was introduced to um, the likes of Boris Gardner and, and uh, Ruddy Thomas and all these people, and they would take me to their shows, I would do backup with Boris Gardner and then I would sing, do collaborations on stage with him. Uh, I remember meeting um, Pam All. J.C. Lodge, Nadine Sutherland, Cynthia Sloss, Sharon Forrester. And we all sang background vocals in studios for all the top artists and for all the international artists coming to town. We were, we run things them time with background vocals. <laughs> so it was a pretty cool experience for me. I, yeah, I was starstruck. I was around all the stars. I was like this little baby around the stars. So for me, it was so cool. Now, besides working with Toots, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in later in, in our chat, of that time of you doing your background vocals and backup vocals, what's your favorite memory? Uh, oh, my gosh. As, as I said before, just working with all the stars that I used to hear on the radio before coming to music, that was like a big deal for me. Another star that I worked with um, that I never would imagine when the first time I I did background vocals in studio for Sting from the police. Yeah, that was that was like super cool. I was like, yeah, it was it was myself, Sly and Robbie and the crew and um, Liba, Liba Hibbert. Toots Hibbert's daughter. And I remember every time we did something and, and Sting loved it. He would just come and say, thank you. Thank you so much. And kiss you on the cheeks, both both sides. He was so cool. About it. I, that's I, I was, an awesome memory, girl. That's a pretty yeah. awesome memory. So now we're going to uh, talk a little bit about some of the great producers that you worked with. I know you worked with Jermaine, Donovan Jermaine and Bobby Digital and Patrick Roberts. Uh, tell me, did you have a 
favorite? Is there one that you especially clicked with? Oh, Lord, that's a that, that, that's like putting me in the spot. I, know, I, um, I loved all of them for different reasons. I love all of them for different reasons. And all of them brought out something different in me. Like, say, with German. German and, and I, we have this like, this, I hope I don't let him blush when he hears this. But I think we have a musical romance that whenever we come together, magic happens. Something happens when I'm with Jeremy. Bobby, I love no. that. I love that story. I, I, I love musical romance. I mean, that I think that's a very special connection to have with your, this is as a With producer, the producers. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing is, Jeremy does not talk much. He will just sit there and intimidate you the whole time, you know. But something happens when I work with German and then Bobby Digital. Bobby Digital did not speak much either, but he was he was, he, he had more like a little vibe there going and stuff. And Bobby Digital will pull other stuff out of me. I I don't even know how to explain it. It was so interesting. Uh, Exterminator that was Fatis. Fatis wasn't a talker either, but he say Fatis just had this hardcore style about him and, you know, the, the whole vibes. And, and I think that the environment too, the studios, you know, that you work out of, it had that whole energy and stuff that you pull from. Shocking vibe was more dancehall, dancehall. So that's where I had to be like, re like, re dancehall, twiggy, you know? So I, you know, Did I you loved enjoy all of that. Did you enjoy being dancehall twiggy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because because I have this little hardcore style to me that a lot of people don't know. They see me and just see a little sweet thingy. But I'm, I'm like boyish and hardcore and like to, to do stuff that surprises everyone. So for me, dance all is still one of my favorite thing to do. Now, this is this is a kind of a powerful question. You know, most of the producers at that time were men. Mm hmm. We had Sonia Pottinger, but there really weren't many female producers, always men. And I have to ask, were they always fair in their contracts with you as opposed to male musicians or singers? And were there even contracts? No contract to do the productions. But there, I mean, I remember when I was joining Penthouse, there was a contract, you know, to become a Penthouse artist and stuff and shocking vibes also. But for the most part, to just do the work, like productions and stuff. Bobby, Fair, though, that's the question. Bobby Digital, the, the first two times I recorded Bobby Digital, he came into a contract. Yes, he did. For the most part, I think in Jamaica, the producers don't really do contracts. They just work and the artists just go along with it. So I don't I know. Those I days have changed. I hope so. I too. would think now, you know, 20, 30 years, 40 years later that, you know. But I guess with German. People understand them. Right. I guess with German, because I was already on a contract with him as a penthouse artist. I guess I never needed to have a contract to record with him. But like, say, Bobby Digital and Fatis and stuff, I was just doing independent work with them. So as, as, yeah. as a backup singer, as a background singer? No. Or um, a- in studio, they used me to do some of their background vocals. Yeah, like I used to do a lot of Bobby's background vocals. I did a lot of Penthouse background vocals mm-hmm. and I did a lot of Shocking Vibes background vocals. But I did less background vocals at Shocking Vibes. It was mostly lead, but... Yeah, in studio, because I guess if they have me and I can do it, you know, why not? (laughs) What were some of the obstacles that you faced to move yourself forward to become a front singer, to become a solo singer? What were some of the obstacles that you faced? To tell the truth, I always say this, that I think I'm so blessed in the music because I never really had to face any obstacles. Wentinger gave me the push and he took me to Boris Gardner and Roddy Thomas and Derek Harris and stuff. That started a whole new thing for me. And then he introduced me to like uh, Sugar Minot, uh, Charlie Chaplin, all these people. They And T- um, Tristan Palmer, they took me over to their end and I was working with them. And as I said, I was just flowing because right after that... I I met Tootsie's daughters and I became a part of the group 5446 Mm -hmm. with his two daughters. In doing so, Toots grabbed all of us and started touring with us as the Mittels. Have you ever been told to change something about yourself by any producer or someone that you were working for? Never. 
never i i was always accepted for who i am and for the vocalist that i am too it, it's it's interesting you know they i guess they always just love my style and my look and whatever i've never had that issue one that's why I'm, I'm happy to hear that was there ever any pressure from producers to veer into the slackness lane no, never, ever, ever. Because the producers I worked with, they they weren't into that kind of thing anyway. And plus, they loved, as I say, they loved what I what what I had to offer. So they just wanted to build on that. I'm happy to hear that as well. Now, what lessons did you learn from those days that you carried forward with you into the the new millennium? What lessons did you learn and carry with you? Well, from the 90s, you, I learned to be a strong woman because in the 90s, we never had certain technologies and stuff uh, to, to work with and to help us to flow easier and more smoothly. So I've always had to be like a soldier in a sense, you know, you are always around the men. It's male dominated. So I've always had to learn to flow with the men. Also in studio, you know, when, when rhythm are on, you better learn how to get on those rhythms before they run away and leave you. <laughs> so I, le- I learned how to be quick and, and how to just work just like the men. Also, I learned to get my music business in order, you know, for the most part. The 90s taught me a lot to that. And that brings me to my next question. When did you start writing your songs professionally? I started writing since I got the break to, to start recording, especially I think at Penthouse was when I really started to sing my own songs because I started writing from I was a child, little girl. So I wrote a lot of poems and songs since I was a kid. So even one of my hit songs with Penthouse, I mean, I wrote that song, it was just for my vivid imagination. So after that, I started experimenting professionally with my writing skills. Knowing what you know today, would you have done anything differently back then? Yeah, only, I think only one thing I'll do differently. And it's, as I say, be more aware of the business side of the industry. You know, back in the day, you used to just be touring and hanging out, you know, like just having a good time and, you know, doing a lot of music. So you weren't focused on the business aspect of things. So that's the only thing I would have done differently. Okay. And and looking back on the changes, everything that you witnessed during those decades of of history and change right up to today, what stands out to you as most helpful and what stands out to you as most detrimental? Oh, wow. Take Um, your time. The things that you witnessed, right? Because you saw a lot. Okay. mm -hmm. Out of everything that you witnessed, what stands out as most helpful? Well, I witnessed a lot of veterans, you know, working with a lot of veterans and stuff and a lot of really talented people. And I think I have taken a lot of pages out of their book, you know, which I I am taking over into my career now, you know, where I mean, even just their performances and as I say, how they how they go about getting their stuff in order. That is very helpful for me. Because to tell the truth, I haven't witnessed anything really crazy in the industry. A lot of people would say like, oh, what, what, what? I've never really experienced anything like crazy, crazy, crazy. The simple little things that I take note of. Because there, there's nothing really detrimental that I can say that. Um, okay, that's a very good answer, Madeira. I saw an interesting <laughs> quote from you. You were being interviewed by Michael Connolly, the late Michael mm-hmm. Connolly. He, was, he, he also wrote for a regular report magazine back then. Oh, cool. Yeah, he was a great Kingston. Uh, yeah. For sure. Now, he, you told him that the 80s and 90s is the era that you would revisit because, quote, it had some of the best music ever made and it was just about having a great time, unquote. Do you still feel yes. the same way? Oh, yeah. I would go back in time just to do the 80s and the 90s again. I, I mean, I the love for music at that time was just off the chain. It wasn't about a, a hype and fame. Yes, the artists used to have their little thing going on. But it wasn't about hype and fame so much. It was about the passion and the love for the music. So you used to be able to enjoy music. You used to be able to enjoy being around the fraternity. We were so close-knitted at the time. It's like we were all family. So you just felt happy when when you were around them. So yes, of course, I would revisit the 80s and the 90s anytime. (laughs) 
Me too. Okay. (laughs) So now we're going to talk a little bit about social media. Mm-hmm. In the 80s and 90s, uh, we had we were blessed to have telephones and fax lines, you know, fax machines. Uh-huh. And yeah, and uh, we were one of the first to have fax machines. It was a, a lifesaver putting together a magazine. Radio and print were like the social media of our time. And then that's why Reggae Report came about as a way to spread this music and news around country and then the world. And what do you think about today's social media? Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, are they important in today's market? If so, why? If not, why not? Oh, most definitely important in today's market. To tell the truth, I have been trying to catch up with social media now because, as you said before, we had nothing like that, you know, during our time. As you say, you had a fax machine. That was like the future, you know, but we, we didn't even realize that eventually that would become obsolete. You know? Like, yeah. oh boy, you know. So yeah, social media, it's crazy because that's the tool that the younger generation has now. And that is what is catapulting them to the next level so quickly. Us from my um, era, we're, we're still learning how to use this tool because we're not used to it. But I think it's a great tool. And I think once you know how to maneuver it and, you know, work with it, it can do many stuff for you. So, you know, yeah, I think it's a good thing. Okay. I think it's awesome. All right. And then that leads me to this question is, what do you see the effect of social media on a global scale, the effect on the world view of reggae and dancehall music today? I think, I think really and truly it, it has a great effect, but some people are using the tool in the wrong way. Some people are using the platform in the wrong way. And because, you know, you're free to do whatever you want to do, it's kind of becoming a little crazy, you know, for some people. Like if you're just trying to, to sell your music and let people see you as a face and stuff, it's great. But for, as I say, for some, you're taking it to another level where, you know, it's nakedness, it's, it's you know, person, it's politics. A lot of artists are getting involved in politics and stuff. Yes, we all have our say our thoughts and stuff. But for me, I think we keep those, you know, amongst ourselves and just let that be that if we use it the correct way, it can be a massive platform for reggae music. Now, I see that you are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and YouTube. Do you post yourself or do you have social media assistance? I post myself. And that is why uh, it, it's not as out there like everybody else is, because I don't think I'm doing such a great job. But is that a call I for like <laughs> I know I like to. But the thing with me is I like to interact with my audience. So, you know, a lot of people yeah. say, oh, you're too nice. You're too nice. But for me. I think if they want to talk to me and they want to, you know, just feel good about knowing me, I like to interact with them personally so they can see that, oh, Tuggy is a really cool girl and we support her all the way. So, yeah. Do you have a favorite platform out of those that you're on? Do you have a favorite one that maybe you get to interact in real time with your fans? Do you have a favorite one? I interact better on Facebook because I still do not know how to really tweet. Uh, Instagram, Instagram. I just post my pictures and stuff and my music and, and and just hope that people will come over and love it, you know. But Instagram and Facebook, I get uh, yeah, a few likes here and there. Now, we're going to uh, take a, a turn here and we're going to talk about Twiggy today, okay? Mm-hmm. This is where I would like to hear a little bit about your 23 years as part of Toots and the Maytals as a member of 5446. Didn't know that was you up there. <laughs> you know, I thought I really thought they were all Toots's daughters. So if you yeah. can give us a short summary, if, if you can, how you became part of 5446, your experiences in the studio and on the road with Toots, how you felt when we lost Toots, and how you felt to receive a reggae Grammy for your involvement with Toots's last album, Got to Be Tough. I know that's a lot of questions. I'm curious to hear, and I'm sure the fans are too, what was it like being part of Toots' family for all those years? 
Oh my gosh, so amazing. Uh, you know, even today, um, his daughter Leva, she sent me something, you know, you know, reminding me that it's a year since we lost her dad. And, you know, it just brought up back a lot of memories that I didn't want to come back up. But when I met them, first of all, it was three daughters, right? And one went off to do gospel. So they said they wanted to audition someone. And Tootsie's son, called Hopeton, he was the one that found me. I don't even remember how he found me, but he found me. And he took me to them and they auditioned me. And like, like I was perfect. I was a perfect fit. So it, I, I always say it was 54, one of the daughters. I was the dash in the middle. And then the <laughs> other daughter was 46. Oh, that's so, great. I love that. <laughs> I know, right? So we started, they started having like major hits over in London and stuff. And we started doing our own tours in the Caribbean and over to London to do Top of the Pops and stuff like that. And that was pretty cool in itself. That, that was like my first time on TV and stuff. And I was like, yeah, big star and thing or whatever, you know? You were. So, yeah. And so, um, took no, that's when he, he, I guess he came to the, they got this big idea, like, hey, you know what? You guys are going to be the Matos. So we started touring with Toots. You know, I was the youngest one out of the three. So Toots used to be so overprotective of us as the children. And he, every, he used to treat me like I was his baby daughter. So even now, a lot of his fans, when they see me, oh, your dad and your dad and your dad, because they think I'm his daughter. Yes, it, it was an amazing experience. When I even think about it, sometimes I feel so down because I I lived for the experience with Toots. You, you, you watch Toots on stage sometimes, you come off the stage feeling overwhelmed in a good way. When you come off, you're like, oh my God, what, what did I just experience? Because he never did the same show twice. Do you have a favorite, I know it'd be hard to pick one, but I know favorite memory with Toots? Oh my gosh, so many, so many, so many, yeah. so many, it's hard. But you know what? I'll pick a food memory because Toots knew that I love my food, you know? Every time like Toots will, we'll go to certain uh, areas like in Europe, especially, and there is no food that we can find. Toots will just surprise us. He will go down to the kitchen of the hotel and he will talk to them. I don't know how he even talks to them in their language. <laughs> and he'll let them know, okay, I need shrimps. I need this, I need that. And he will go into their kitchen and cook the whole band. Oh, my God. That's a great story. A meal, yeah. And he was a great cook. When he used to cook that curry shrimp and the coconut rice and stuff. And then we used to get the phone call. Okay, come down to the restaurant. And we're like, what? We look everything. Food laid out and wine and stuff. Because he used to love to treat us the food. He used to take us to some of the most expensive restaurants in Europe and Anywhere we're at and just let everybody just eat what they want and drink what they want and just enjoy. Those are some of my favorite memories apart from the music. Those are great. I love those memories. I love the personal ones. You know, that's what Mm -hmm. people like me, I'm like a super fan. And I know there's a lot of people like me that out there that are super (laughs) fans. And just Mm -hmm. to hear that kind of story to show the, the intimacy. I'm so happy you shared that story. That's a great story. Yeah. And so for me, you know, today makes a year. Yes. And, um, you know, I woke up trying not to think about it or anything like that, because it, it, it breaks my heart every time I think about it. What I try to do is think about the memories, sure. the good memories, you know. Yeah, but and look how he's all making that. a smile right now, you know. I know, right? Because we both have this big smile on our faces. A fireball. <laughs> a fireball, you know. And, you know, he used to sing the song, Me name Naya, Me eat fire, you know. <laughs> yeah, and we had to be singing that on stage. My name is Naya, we eat fire, you know. But yes, so uh, you, this gift of the Grammy that he gave me, I don't even know how to express how it felt to know that, you know, I was on that album because Toots is very uh, meticulous about what he chooses to be on his albums and stuff. So even though you work with him all the time, you're not sure what he's going to put on an album or what he's going to change. He will do a song 10 times, 10 to 10 different people. And then you're like, okay, I worked on that, but it's not you. So you never know. (laughs) What you're going to end up on, you know? So for me, this was like a surprise. And do you know the thing that happened? I dreamt it after he died, before I even knew that I was nominated. He dreamt me and he told me, 
I, I saw Liba and myself in the dream and he was talking to both of us and he said, like he said, I have a song that I'm giving you both as a gift. And we were just looking at him. And even in the dream, I was saying, he's still giving, even though he's not here anymore, he's still giving. So when I when I got up, I was praying, like, what did this dream mean? And I just knew it was a Grammy. So when I was told about the, the Grammy Award, I was like, OK, OK, I'm getting a Grammy. <laughs> so thank awesome. you, Naya. Thank you yeah. so much. I cherish it. That's a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that really twiggy. Mm-hmm. Now we're going to move on into mm-hmm. uh, 2021. So I see that you have a new single out, which I like very much, uh, on Penthouse called When I Think About You. So tell us a little bit about the song. You wrote it, I believe, right? And then Donovan Germain produced it, and it's on the Let Me Tell You Boy rhythm. Tell me a little bit about the song, and then tell me who chose the rhythm. Actually, it's it's very simple, you know. Donovan just gave me that rhythm. <laughs> You know, uh, I, I, you know, along with a few more. And he said, uh, just do your thing on them, you know. Enjoy this clip of Twiggy doing her thing on When I Think About You, released in 2021, produced by Donovan Germain for Penthouse Records. I feel warm when it is cold outside when I think about you, I think about you. My emotions I just can't hide when I think about you. So now you've worked for decades with the penthouse crew. Tell us a little bit about your time there, like, and your experiences of working with Donovan. I know you've you've given this quite a bit, but is there anything special that you remember? I mean, you were there, you've been working with that penthouse crew a long time, you know? What did what have you learned there? What have you what is your takeaway from from being part of the penthouse crew? Being part of the Pentel School was one of my favorites. And, I, and I'm not saying this just because I'm on camera. It's one of my favorite time in, you know, in my professional life. Because that was a time when I, when my career went to, to another level. Because before that, I was working with, you know, like independent producers and stuff. But no one really knew the name Twiggy like that, except for in Japan. stuff. Because I was working a lot in Japan in, in those days before penthouse actually donovan germain met me in japan wow yeah we were backstage yes we were backstage and all these years i was working out of penthouse with other producers but he never knew or saw me then you know and it was in japan you know i guess when i came off stage and he said i want to talk to you and that's how the whole recruiting thing came about. So when I came up at that time, I joined Penthouse Crew. And for me, that's when my career catapulted. The name Twiggy became, you know, a name out there. It was just so cool working there because, as I said before, Jermaine is a very, very good producer. He's very good at what he does and he knows what he wants. As I say, and, he, and, that, and that caused you also to work with Garnett and Buju and, and Buju and you know. Beris and Marcia yeah. and Tony Revel and, and you had Wayne a hit Wanda. song. You had a hit song with Buju in the nineties. Yes, right? I want your love. Yeah. yeah, and so for me, working with these people, it was like sometimes I cannot find the words to express it, especially like even Buju and Beris, and they were like so cool with it, and they knew what they wanted all the time, and they always had hit songs everything they come up with was a hit so for me it's like I had to keep up I had to make sure that whatever I'm going to do it better be good 
And trust me, if it wasn't good, you're not making the cut. That was where my training came in, you know, where I had to know how to stand with the men and, and whatever rhythm is on, you better find something for it, you know. So with Penthouse, it was so cool. Penthouse is when I started doing my tours as Twiggy. As I said, apart from the whole Japan stints that I used to do, Penthouse is when I started experiencing like Europe, you know, Europe and all these other countries, you know, the Caribbean islands and stuff, you know. Yeah, so Penthouse for me As was a like solo my- artist, are you talking? Yes. About- okay. Mm-hmm. Because you, you travel to those places with toots, right? Yes, but I now did you're also a too. Artist. Yeah, yeah. because when I started working with toots, my first set of tours were in the U.S. So when I went to Europe, my first time, it was with Penthouse. Yeah, it was with Penthouse. Okay. I did England with 5446 because of the top of the pop, the song that was in the chart. But I never did Europe. Penthouse now is when I started doing Europe and stuff or whatever as a solo as a solo artist and working you know alongside Bujo and Wayne Wanda throughout that you know that whole time that whole period Penthouse is when I got the experience to go to Africa and that was an experience in itself yeah. if we should talk about Africa that would blow your mind and so for me it was one of the most interesting and exciting periods of my career and it's still going on right? Yeah. Well, yeah, somewhat. Yeah. <laughs> well, you had a new single with them. New right? thing, Yeah. But, you know, with COVID, we can't be out there. Oh, so, that's, you know. ex- that's true. That's exactly mm-hmm. right. That's exactly right. All right. Now we're beginning to wrap up here. So I would like you to tell our fans um, what creative projects are in your orbit now. You know, I- I'm, I'm just, I'm just flowing with how my, how, how I'm feeling. So I have a few stuff that I've done with, you know, recently with, with Penthouse and I have some other independents, uh, not so well-known name producers that I'm working on, you know, compilation albums with them. And I'm in dialogue about doing a new album for myself. Okay. So, you know, I'm just going with the flow and just waiting to see who I really want to do this well, album with. You're writing with. songs, I take it. Oh yeah, I'm I'm always in writing mode, and and for me, writing is is as Jamaicans would say, simple one too. You know, so I just have to hear something, and I'll just I'll just flow. You know, so those are the creative stuff that I am um, involved in right now, and just uh, going with the flow, just. All right. Now, there are many resources out there for artists and everyone in the music business to keep learning and improving. What resources do you use to stay up to date on the music industry, the reggae music industry, or on your specific interests? Are there books or podcasts, apps that you download, any social feeds that you go to? For me, it's mostly social media. I, I'm so boring. <laughs> I'm so boring. <laughs> I'm, you are I'm not just, boring, Twiggy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just learning how to get into these podcasts and stuff like that. But social media, yes, I've been learning and I read a lot. I, you know, I read a lot. I, I might not necessarily buy the physical books, but I, I'm always online, you know, Google. You know, Google is one of my friends right here. <laughs> yeah, always Googling stuff and, you know, wanting to better understand what's going on and how I can better my career, you know, how I can do things, you know, differently and stuff like that. Yeah, basically social media. Now, our final question, my final question. What or which exceptional, masterful song that you know of do you wish that you had written, sung, recorded, or performed? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, you mean by any artist? And by any artist, anywhere, anytime. Just a oh masterpiece of a song that you wish you had the name Twiggy on it. That's that's an interesting question. <laughs> let me see, let me see. And you're like, why didn't I write that song? <laughs> wow. It would it would probably probably be something from Michael Jackson or something. Oh. Yeah. Um that could make that work. change. Make that change. Oh okay. The is that Jackson's the name song. is that the name of the song though? We're gonna make that change. 
Oh, that's oh, great once song. in my, my life. life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think if anything, it would probably be that song. I am sure after our interview, I'm going to come up with many more like, why did I say that one? Why did I say that one? But right now, this is the one that came okay. to me. Okay, that's a great song. So you, you did pick a good one for sure. Well, Miss Twiggy, I have to tell you, this has been absolutely delightful, really. I've Yay! enjoyed I've enjoyed our our time together here and and our Zoom interview. And I think that we've just answered the question that Reggae Trilogy <laughs> asked about where are they now? Mm-hmm. And officially, I have moved Miss Twiggy into the Women in Reggae chapter. Yay! <laughs> Because you are an amazing woman and a very, no, you are, and a talented artist. And I appreciate your perseverance. I admire your openness to step forward and share your, your story with us. And I think that you are a fine example for young women artists everywhere. Thank you so much. Coming from you, that's like so dear to my heart. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss for words right now. You, you left me speechless for real. You know, and and thank you so much because I feel the same way about you in thank your you. in your industry. I feel the same way about you. I think you're a giant in what you do and and how you have uh, endorsed our music and and taken our music to the other level through your magazine. And so for me, that's a big thing hearing from you. Thank you thank so much again, Peggy. Yeah, well, we got and we got to keep that era alive. You know, the eighties mm-hmm. and nineties, and we got to keep the pioneers. You know, they deserve all the respect that we can give them because it was pre-internet so yeah. we want people to know about what we talked about and did then and recorded and who we hung out with and we have to tell them thank you to the fans for joining us here on let's meet backstage i'm M. peggy quattro and i look forward to our next music session and history lesson right here backstage one love Hey, Reggae fam, it's M. Peggy Q. Check our show notes on your listening device for my contact info, social media links on today's guest, music credits, a link to reggaereport.com, and more. You'll learn how you can receive a free download of my popular ebook, Reggae Trilogy, 200 plus 80s and 90s artist headshots, volume one. You've never seen reggae history like this before. Give thanks for listening.